Hello my lovely people on the interwebs, how's it going? It is I, your one and only Hyrule Gamer. THE Hyrule Gamer? And welcome back to what has kind of become a little series on my channel, Secrets of Hyrule. A time and place, well, more a 10 to 15 minute YouTube video but you get the point, to take a look at some of your favourite Zelda secrets, hidden gems, references and so much more across the Legend of Zelda series. That's right, these videos are actually nearly 100% fan suggested now going forward, for two reasons. One, I can't always find enough cool secrets, and two, because I just really love all of you. It's a fun way to include you guys in the video, so please always feel free to send me suggestions for future videos and hey, you might just get yourself featured. This time, we are returning to Breath of the Wild for a fourth edition on the game, with our focus being towards more unique and almost weird secrets. Be sure to go grab yourself a Fergalicious snack or drink and send them in on social media to get featured right here, and without further ado, let's look at 5 unique secrets in Breath of the Wild that you might have missed. In the current state of Hyrule, the kingdom is in ruins, a cataclysmic attack that devastated the lives of this land forever, a primal evil that left its mark on history. Everything that once was, now lies in a state of decay, and one of the centerpieces of that decay is Hyrule Castle, the heart of Hyrule, the home of the royal family in Sheikah Research. This mighty castle holds a lot of cool secrets and details, such as a book with the recipe to monster cake within the library, and the outside of the sanctum breaking through some of the rock between it and the castle. However, there is another really awesome detail within the throne room atop the castle. Above where the King of Hyrule once stood, we can see a metal frame of a melody. Recognise it? Well, this isn't any old decoration. The melody we see here is actually the notes of Zelda's lullaby from Ocarina of Time. Here it is in its original glory. And there are those same notes but in the throne room in Breath of the Wild. This is one I never noticed when I first played Breath of the Wild, as in all honestly, I was just sh myself in Hyrule Castle. I was more concerned about what the heck this is, but either way, it's a neat little nod to one of the most iconic and recognisable songs in The Legend of Zelda. The combat in Breath of the Wild is definitely different from the usual style. Not in a bad way necessarily, it's just different, but something that's not okay with it is a very very small and hard to notice mistake with Link to draw with a bow. If you look closely whilst drawing any bow in Breath of the Wild, you might notice something wrong with Link's hand. Well, if you haven't seen it yet, it's right here. His drawing hand. Typically when a right-handed person such as Link in Breath of the Wild draws a bow, the inside of their hand would be facing themselves. This allows for better control, accuracy and also to minimise strain, but Link holds it the completely wrong way around and it's just got me like, why? There is so much wrong with this and it's not like this is a Link thing as in past games he draws the bow perfectly fine. Twilight Princess, the hand is facing inwards, Wind Waker, facing inwards, Skyward Sword, inwards, and even though it's a little hard to see due to the ratio of the game, in Ocarina of Time, his hand is also facing inwards. Why on earth does he have his draw hand upside down in Breath of the Wild? This was actually brought to my attention by my good buddy Zack. Hi Zack, love you Zack. And I even picked his brain a little on this as he has a bit more experience with a bow than me. Drawing out like this would create an unnecessary amount of strain on the shoulder due to the way his hand is twisted, so make of that what you will. It's definitely a secret, or I guess sort of a mistake that is a secret that not many people notice, but one that when you do, you will never unsee it. The Great Plateau is, for me, the most enjoyable Zelda tutorial. It teaches you the key mechanics of the game without even feeling that way. It integrates the foundations of the game's story into it, which is part of what makes it so good. Within this introduction area, we can find a little nod to the third installment in the series, A Link to the Past. Upon awakening within the Shrine of Resurrection and entering the Kingdom of Hyrule, one of the first few things you'll see, assuming you follow the natural path, which if you don't you're a complete psycho, is a sword high up on a pedestal. For most fans, this would resemble the classic Master Sword position, and it is sort of referencing that. 
In A Link to the Past, when trying to locate the Master Sword, you can actually find false Master Swords. Blades that are more or less valueless in comparison to the Blade of Evil's Bane. And this blade here on the Great Plateau is considered by many fans to be a little nod towards those fake Master Swords. It's not something I personally noticed right away, but in response to some of my posts regarding these secret videos, I saw this one brought up quite a lot. Make of it what you will, but I love this little nod to a classic Zelda title. Back in the days before Breath of the Wild was released to the world, back when we all referred to it as Zelda U or Zelda NX, we got a few trailers to build up the hype, and one of them actually hides a little secret of sorts. In the 2016 E3 trailer for Breath of the Wild, we open up with some cinematic shots of Hyrule's breathtaking landscape, our first proper look at the scale of this new, open world Hyrule. This moment had many of us in tears, no joke. It was a beautiful moment, but what the heck is that? In this early shot of the trailer, we can see what appears to be a Stalnox roaming the hearth and valley of Southern Hyrule, but something isn't right here. Oh yeah, it's bloody daytime. We know from exploring Hyrule in the night that we can encounter stall enemies, skeletal undead counterparts to the Bacoblins, Moblins, Lazalfos, and for this pick, Hinox. The stall enemies only appear at night, typically breaching the earth below Link's feet and crawling into life, very similar to the stall children from Ocarina of Time. The Stalnox, however, is a little different. We don't see them rise from the ground in Breath of the Wild, rather, we can come across a set of bones just laying around in the open. During the day, there is nothing to fear about this, but come nightfall and these bones come to life. The remains of this beast begin to join together and create the skeletal structure of a Hinox, with the weak spot for killing it being the eyeball which also remained intact. So what's the secret here? Well, I believe that the original plan for the Stalnox, or stall enemies in general for Breath of the Wild, may have been to allow them to rise whenever, during the day or during the night, because we can clearly see here in the trailer a stall enemy roaming during the daylight. We can clearly see that the sun is out and shining during this shot, but the Stalnox is still alive, but not alive? Ideas and plans do tend to change throughout development, so I think it's possible that originally we were due to see these undead monsters roam Hyrule during both the day and night. I think it's more fitting being just at night, but this is a cool little forgotten detail to know. Were the Stalnox originally planned to be seen during the day? My favourite type of secrets to cover are the ones that reference things from the past. From the subtle false Master Sword reference to A Link to the Past found on the Great Plateau, to the musical references within Hyrule Field calling back to Ocarina of Time. But a new reference, or bunch of references I noticed recently, is jewels and body pieces that reference the different stones and symbols from Ocarina of Time. The champions Mifa, Urbosa and Daruk all hold a piece of this reference. If you look closely at their attire, you can see that Mifa's headpiece actually has two Zora sapphires designed into to it, a direct reference to the Spiritual Stone of Water. Daruk also holds a Spiritual Stone reference within his body gear. We can see in the central region an encrusted Goron Ruby design, and whilst I personally couldn't find the third Spiritual Stone, the Kokiri Emerald, I did notice something else from the game. Urbosa rocks a pair of earrings that are shaped into the original crescent of the Gerudo symbol, something that actually changed due to Nintendo not wanting their in-game symbols to resemble real-world religious symbols. But what's cool is that along with the original symbol, we can also see the newer version located on our waist. If you happen to come across that Kakiri Emerald in your adventures in Breath of the Wild, be sure to let me know through Twitter or Discord, and we'll make sure to get it featured next time. But for now, all I could see was those two really awesome references to the spiritual stones, and the neat little nod to the Gerudo. Thanks a ton for watching, I really hope you enjoyed this episode of Secrets of Hyrule, and if you did, be sure to drop a like down below and consider subscribing for more Zelda content. Did you learn any new secrets or perhaps have some of your own secrets you'd like to share? Be sure to leave a comment down below and look out for my replies. Huge thanks as always to all of my wonderful supporters on both YouTube and Patreon. I love you all so much and cannot thank you enough for the support you give me. Special mentions to new patrons Matty B and Killith. If you'd like to help support the channel and get your name featured at the end of all of my videos, a shout out upon joining and more, then consider supporting on either YouTube or Patreon. Again, thanks for watching, and until the next time, I've been Hyrule Gamer. <laughs>